we had high drama in our last talk and I'm not sure I can follow it with the same, uh, same level of uh, excitement, but the monastic history can offer what, what I can't. One day upon entering St. Benedict's room, St. Benedict's, not Father Benedict, an old friend of his found him weeping bitterly. After he had waited for some time and there was still no end to the abbot's tears, he asked what was causing such sorrow, for he was not weeping as he usually did in prayer, but with deep sighs and lamentation. Almighty God has decreed that this entire monastery and everything I have provided for the community shall fall into the hands of the barbarians. It was only with the greatest difficulty that I could prevail upon God to spare the lives of its members. St. Gregory the Great goes on, this was the prophecy he made, and we have seen its fulfillment. The Lombards came at night while the community was asleep and plundered the entire monastery without capturing a single monk. He allowed the barbarians to destroy the monastery, but safeguarded the lives of the religious. This important passage from the life of St. Benedict, written around 600 AD, recalls the prophecy and subsequent destruction of Monte Cassino in 589. While the great patron of Europe neither planned nor executed a pattern of monastic, monastic missionizing of the continent, his followers did. And this episode of barbarian invasion, a hostile takeover in the middle of the night, remained an indelible icon of St. Benedict's love of buildings. Let us recall for a moment the episode's detail. The saint was weeping, even though the monks would be saved. He wept for the stones themselves and for what they represented, a whole project of building for God, including a tiled roof which sheltered his monks from storms, gardens which fed them in famine, wells which brought them water, and vines which brought them wine to drink. Monks can even have a little bit of wine every day. This is a fitting image for the conference since we as Catholics believe at the deepest core of our faith in the incarnation. Matter, buildings, matter matters. God would save man by becoming a man. The res resurrection of Christ was not just a spiritual resurrection. He rose bodily in the flesh as you and I are here today. The destroyed temple would be renewed in this God-made man. Christ himself revealed this cosmic architectural plan, destroy this temple, and in three days I will build it up again. All discussion then of real estate for Christians returns to this principle. All buildings we build, restore, and inhabit should reflect this mystery. Otherwise, they have already gone to the barbarians, already they they already belong to the barbarians. Today, I will share with you what the loss and recovery of a real estate treasure meant for us as monks in Norcia, and what that can tell us about the church's real estate and its future. I'll offer a brief summary of the events, three principles that emerged in our response, and finally, how these three principles might help you manage the real estate questions for the church today. Before doing so, I would also like to greet most warmly His Eminence, Cardinal Pell, who gave a wonderful talk this morning. I was privileged to visit him in another location on the Queen's real estate in Australia uh, and uh, to see him in these uh, pleasant surroundings is a joy. I would also like to thank the organizers of the conference for the honor of inviting me to speak. In 2016, now, five years ago, a 6.8 magnitude earthquake brought the ancient basilica constructed over St. Benedict's home, his birthplace, the crypt of which dated from before Christ, to a pile of rubble in a matter of six seconds. Moments before, two of our monks had been standing on the other side of it, preparing to offer the holy sacrifice of the mass. Instead, they rushed to safety, unharmed but covered in dust and dirt, bewildered at the noise, at the intensity, at the speed of the destruction that decimated 13 churches in the town of Norcia alone and thousands of churches throughout Umbria. 
As the priests of the monastery ran through the town to give the last rites to the dying, we found that there were many who were injured, many who were afraid, but none who were mortally wounded. While there were deaths in many towns, our town, Norcha, had none. Our monks survived, and we were left with a striking, even disturbing image, very much like what St. Benedict saw in his vision of the destruction of Monte Cassino. Lives were spared, but buildings were lost. The basilica with its cruciform shape was emptied. There was the facade, there was the apse, but everything inside, everything in the middle of this grand church was gone in six seconds. The 14th century bell tower had fallen through the dome and the nave deep into the first century crypt. Four of us monk priests were stuck with about 100 lay people in the central piazza until firefighters bulldozed a path to take us to safety. Our families in America learned the news when they woke up hours later and turned on the news. To many faithful in town and abroad, this was the death, not just of a building, but of a symbol, Vetusta Nurcia's place in history and culture. From 1810 until when we arrived in the year 2000, there had been no monks at St. Benedict's birthplace. For believers and even unbelievers, the basilica represented the Benedictine identity. As a new young community founded in the latter days of John Paul II's pontificate, we saw St. Benedict's birthplace as an, as an icon of the rebirth of monastic life, which was desperately needed. We rev revived the ancient monastery and started restoring the ancient basilica. With restorations of side altars, attention to architectural detail and liturgical beauty, we were part of what Rome, what John Paul II liked to call a new evangelization, and the basilica had begun to attract people from all over the world, building a bridge from our town, a little town in the Umbrian countryside, to the world. Did an earthquake mean that all this was to end? At the time, we were many Americans. Was this massive destruction a sign that we should cross the ocean and look to the promised land of America to start over? There was also a darker, more sobering question lurking beneath that. What, what was the destruction of the Basilica to mean? Was this the last blow to the complete barbarian invasion? As each of you considers the role of real estate in the church, I'm sure this question will resonate. What do you do when, seemingly overnight, you find yourselves with an ancient, once splendid church, now empty? The treasure is lost. The months and years that followed were subtly interwoven with this question, yet there was hardly time to ask it let alone to answer it. In a moment of crisis, one senses existential questions, but one always has to deal with practical questions. The first response to the loss had to be practical. After an earthquake has taken your home, you look for a new one where nothing will fall on you. That's your main concern. One doesn't sit down and dream up a master plan. The question is, where are we going to sleep? Tonight, it's true, as his eminence knows from visiting us, that we do a little bit of fasting in Norcia, but sooner or later we will need to eat. Where will we cook? Where will we cook today and not just in three years? Years before the earthquake, our little community had purchased an old ruin outside the walls, a jungle of thorns, of stones and snakes and wild boar, once inhabited by 16th century adventurous friars. Thanks to the earthquake, this too had nearly nothing left, but that was an advantage when you're worried about walls falling on you. There was land and the land was ours. Ownership is very important. That was sufficient to start. 
It sits on a mountain ledge where we could watch over the destroyed city, pray for the inhabitants, and give some protection to our monks so that we could live a little bit of our monastic life in peace. We had journalists, friends, and even family ask us what it all meant. And as they asked, we too wondered, but we noticed something. Every time we paused to ask what it meant, we lost time. We too wanted to know the answer to the question, but we couldn't answer the question. We learned the limits of words and the need for silence in the face of difficulty. In recent times, our culture, and sadly to say even our church, seems to demand constant commentary. And this commentary was asked of us. We became wary of journalists who sometimes even jumped our fence and pointed their cameras over our walls. We had to be ruthlessly practical and not idealistic and say no. There is little room to be romantic when one has to work out plumbing for 20 monks in the woods with winter quickly approaching. By the way, outdoor showers with garden hoses, these work very well on August afternoons, but not so well on November afternoons. Yet practical and being practical is what we had to be, did not mean being novel, quite the contrary. For us, monastic life always meant picking up the sixth century rule and asking, why can't we live this way? We gave the rule and not ourselves the benefit of the doubt. There was both a bit of youthful naivete and a well-founded hope and insight in this attitude as monks have been doing this for generations and generations. The absence of a building propelled us deeply into the tradition for which the building itself was built. It turns out it was eminently practical to follow the tradition of the rule. To cite but one example, St. Benedict asks all the monks to sleep in one room so that like soldiers, they can rise together, ready to pray in the middle of the night. And yes, some monks snore. This practice has been out of fashion for several centuries and not just for several decades, but it saved space and broke down just a little of that individualism for which our generation is so unfortunately known. The roots of our tradition became our greatest ally. We designed and built the spaces with the view that the ancients knew more than we do, and therefore we should try listening to them. The church should face east so that the sun rises on one side, allowing the cloister to the south to get all of the daytime sun. We built a well, a kitchen, and a garden so that we could find as much as we needed within our walls. This is crucial to St. Benedict's understanding of stability, which David reminded us is the third vow that the monks take, along with obedience and conversion. The rule itself, over and over again, gave us the key. Stability means the monk is wedded to the place, as many of you are wedded totus tuus to your husbands and wives, and that is the and that the only way for the monk to stay put is if that place gives him everything that he needs. In the marriage, of course, that's not always possible, and that's why that's why there's God. The tradition informed the building, and then the building increased our appreciation for the tradition. So there was a practical response. There was a traditional study. And then finally, the point that we discovered, and which is actually what kept us there, is the need to surrender. To surrender to, to divine providence and not to fight it. Early, earlier on in the process of this rebuilding, we had proposed an enormous brand new structure, might call it kind of American. Some of our Italian neighbors said it was very Las Vegas. <laughs> we had proposed an enormous brand new structure to the Regional Building Commission. We put a lot of money and work into this design. We thought it would allow us a clean slate, a new start. The plan was rejected by the authorities. While frustrating at the time, surrendering to this reality led us back to a practical and traditional solution. Rebuild a ruin, 
where it was and how it was. Such surrender also helped us to stop fighting the bureaucracy. It actually brought peace. We started living in tents on the land that God has given us, had given us. Townspeople themselves without houses, often sleeping in their own cars. After an earthquake, that's where many people sleep. They brought us food. YouTube videos, email updates, and our beer sales, we've been making beer since 2012, brought financial resource to, resources to us that we didn't think ever possible. Small tents turned into larger tents, large tents became small cabins, and then small cabins became larger wooden buildings. We began to work on our 16th century stone church, the only one left standing in Norcia, but we began to work on this out of necessity. There was nothing else. We added hundreds of 15 meter micro piles to reach the stone ledge. We read books about earthquakes and invited speakers to teach us about Japanese skyscrapers and how they sit on seismic isolators made in Italy. We ordered the isolators. Our benefactors appreciated that we had chosen a more modest project and the funds came quickly. All of this was less glamorous than the sparkling first plan, but we knew that it was the right fit. It was actually an un-American approach. And as I describe it, it might seem also haphazard and somewhat spontaneous. There was no master plan like the laying out of Washington DC. There were dozens of obstacles that we needed to confront. At each juncture, we tried to ask, what does God want from us here? To fight the circumstances or to surrender? We learned that sometimes the greatest fight is actually the one against our own will, and the greatest victory is the surrender to his providence. At times, to fight is just wanting to be God. We now find ourselves in a transitional phase where we are still building while allowing the buildings to shape us even as they take shape themselves. For example, sleeping 20 men in a single room has the advantage that when it's time to get up, no one can make excuses. Everyone has to get up at the same time. But it also means that when one monk gets sick, everyone gets sick. And so we had to build an infirmary we also have had to account for monks getting old. We learn by living and manifest the lessons in brick and mortar. We continue to build. The monastery restoration is more than halfway complete. And now we have started purchasing land around the monastery so that we can have suitable quarter, quarters for guests. Real estate is ever on our mind since without land, we could not have stayed in Norcia. And it was staying put that inspired people around the world to support us and other young men to become monks. For those of you here who have the means, help is still needed for us to build our guest house, as St. Benedict asks his monks to receive all guests as Christ. And we'd be most honored to have any of you come and visit Norcia someday. These are our own personal. Uh, reflections on the past years. In fact, after six years of making almost daily decisions about the future of our monastery's real estate, it still remains difficult to distill what we have learned, but I will try to do that here. And from this summary, give a few suggestions for how you might proceed. Whatever success we've had has been the fruit of a mysterious mix of spontaneity and providence occasioned by dramatic, but also symbolic loss. How can all this possibly inform the church's reflection on the treasure of properties globally, some of which are in dire straits and haunted by different kinds of crises and loss? First, and we could say that this is an incar incarnational principle, ideas and ideals about church buildings can't become an enemy of what's actually practical to do in them. This would be to treat the practical as if it were merely an accident. 
The God of such a world is the clockmaker God of the Enlightenment, who is a distant and uninvolved God with the affairs of men. On the contrary, God's work in history is revealed and carried out through what's necessary, what is unavoidable, what is seemingly coincidental, and sometimes what is just plain realistic. I spoke earlier about our original ambitions for an enormous new monastery on the mountainside built from scratch, a towering symbol of God's greatness and glory, like St. Peter's. But through the bureaucratic and financial blockades, we think God's will for us was made manifest. And in our times in which vocations are ever less numerous, and the global church seems from many vantage points, even if not from our own, exhausted of life, there is something very fitting in a small church, in a small monastery, a small number of monks. To be sure, and thanks be to God, we are growing every day. And there are inquiries that come throughout the world. But still, a smaller monastery with too many monks for it is a more harmonious icon of the present situation than what a large monastery with too few monks might mean. In this sense, I would say that practical, and that's the first point that I have to offer you, is also proportional. And this touches on humility. Solutions have to be practical, and in their own practicality, they also become humble. Being practical has informed our use of spaces, but only because of a clear sense, which comes from the rule and our faith in general, that the purpose of a monastery, and let us say the church, as was said earlier, is to save souls. It is not to make a big splash or a statement or to generate interesting figures for important articles, sometimes aimed at further fundraising. All of this, of course, is important, but it isn't the end, and it can't become the end. Being practical for all of us, men and women of the church, whether we are architects or engineers, benefactors, philanthropists, priors or pastors or cardinals, means putting the love of God and the salvation of souls at the very center of every decision we face. Second, to be practical is not in opposition to being traditional. In fact, a tradition that lacks a view of the practical risks being pure aestheticism and would not likely be fruitful, nor would it likely endure. This was part of the lesson we learned in accepting a smaller monastery, but it is also informed, it has also informed other decisions. Traditions that do endure, and I would say this includes the traditional mass, last because they, were, they grew up over time to meet practical needs. What could be more practical than man's profound existential need to know the transcendent, to have silence and intimacy before God? To take one example from our monastery, we bought our altar rail, the communion rail, from an antique shop for thousands of euros. This had probably been sold to the antique shop by a priest. The altar rail has a practical purpose of allowing people to receive communion in a reverent way, but this practical purpose led to an architectural tradition of delineated spaces, which itself helped delineate the most holy space, the place where God lives in the sanctuary the highest point of the church. The pandemic era internet boom of masses online has proved to many pastors that if men and women don't feel that there is a special sacred place where God actually dwells in church, they aren't going to go there. While the stigma that grew up against these traditional building elements like the altar rail may have some understandable motivation, it helps to recall that the traditional, the traditional usually came to be for a practical purpose, and maybe that practical purpose is still valid. Finally, surrender. The need to surrender to divine providence for us and perhaps for you. The need and good of such surrender has been a theme already present in these short reflections, but I would like to make it a little bit more explicit. When we consider some of the spaces in Rome, 
the ceiling of the Pantheon or the cupola of St. Peter's, we realize that there is a kind of desire to outdo God in his grandeur by building structures that seem to deny natural laws and, and the force of gravity. One might see an analogy of this desire and ambition even in some churches' leaders' plans for their own idea of evangelization. It is, it is a desire not unique to real estate developers, but is present even in bishops. Martha, Martha, Mary has kept the better part. If we are not men and women of prayer, of silently attending to the will of God, our projects will only be ever merely ours. If we make space and not just time for God in our souls, there will be place for God in these buildings. He will dwell there and not just us. I said earlier that building that does not reflect the incarnation of God, his death and resurrection, may as well belong already to the barbarians. That reflection of the image of God must start with those who have the money, the energy, or the duty, as some people in this room might, to build them. Not everyone will understand your uh, or our surrender. For example, it has not been easy for all the people in our town to accept our new location. The symbolic power of the basilica in Norcia remains very strong. Others, however, have seen in our own acceptance of providence, a path to acceptance for themselves as they rebuild from the fragments of their own lives, the fragments of their own homes, and even, we might hope, their own faith. The ways of God are not man's ways. And when the basilica is someday restored, we might just find ourselves with the keys. Finally, in concluding, I would like to share a most providential discovery. Lives of saints are not always transmitted alone in the books that we know. The most common life of St. Benedict is that written by St. Gregory the Great in the sixth century. Often in Italy, towns hold local knowledge widely unknown elsewhere. Last year, we discovered an ancient manuscript of a kind of Benedictine martyrology of the life of St. Benedict himself, which gave a date to his vision, the vision I spoke about at the beginning of the talk of the destruction of Monte Cassino, October 30th. That was the date that he had that vision. That is the same date, 1,500 years later, that the Basilica fell. The discovery helped us put the two events in great context. We, too, have wept for the sense of a failed project, but we have taken joy in the ability to discover its real roots. For us in Norcia, it was the loss of the ancient Basilica and the monastery which sent us into the wilderness. For those whom God has given the resources, there is a possibility to rescue the treasures of the church and to protect them. But to do this wisely requires a deep faith in God who became man, died, and really rose from the dead. It requires a practical and realistic sense rooted in the tradition docile to the workings of divine providence. All who participate in the restoration of the faith and the recovery of the church have an experience of the wilderness, of the barbarians at the gate, of that deep unsettling question of whether or not we are at the end. Saint Athanasius perhaps put it best when he said, they have the churches, but we have the faith. There is a certain line of thought which suggests one must become a kind of barbarian in order to survive the onslaught, but that is not necessarily true, just one approach. There are certain questions which only God can answer, and we must act like Job, quiet and waiting, with greater faithfulness, not less. We live in times of great trial. May these times make us more watchful and more faithful. Thank you.
Thank you, Father, for that very inspiring and profound uh, presentation about what really counts. You mentioned uh, in a fleeting manner, YouTube videos and revenue. I wonder if you could expand upon that a little and also in terms of the, even, the, the capacity for evangelization through those YouTube videos. So I'd take this occasion too to thank Father Gall and all, all of the priests of Opus Dei. There was a wonderful priest to then, I, I don't think he's still there, Father Juan Carlos Dominguez, who said to me many years ago, you have to dream very big. And he said it in a great Spanish accent, you have to dream very big, uh, Father Benedict, because um, Brother Benedict to then, because uh, um, in religious life, your dreams will come true. Uh, and it, he's turned out to be more right than I could have ever expected. We have a rather delicate relationship to uh, technology, and uh, we've actually retreated from its use more than embraced it and tried to be very selective about what we use and how we use it, uh, making a little bit of a, a distinction between what can be understood as a more lasting medium and one which applies to the short, the immediate and the passionate. Uh, YouTube videos have proven helpful to bring those around the world into our, into our little world of Norcia to support uh, what we're doing, to understand what we're doing, to make them participants in what we're doing. And if you, uh, after this talk, if you want to look, look up our, look up, you can type in monks of Norcia and you'll find some good introductory videos there. Uh, we've also used email email campaign campaigns to to invite people to support us and and that has has proved very successful and very helpful on the other hand we have come to see the real danger in using those means to in any way that could risk exploitation of the sacred so uh, around the time of the earthquake we made a decision to stop uh, posting online recordings of the chant that we sing every day not to post any video of the of the holy mass uh, to 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 limit any way in which the sacred could be uh, exploited in a way that deprived it of its central meaning which is actually being with god um, so uh, that has also given us the inclination to step away from social media at the time of the earthquake we used facebook and twitter uh, to to um, in, an, in what we hoped was an evangelical way, but came to find that the, the limits of that uh, interfered for at least as far as we could tell from the, the good that it produced. So uh, our, our sense has been one has to make many distinctions and be regularly reevaluating the technology, the, the, um, the media that are available and whether the benefits do outweigh the risks or not. YouTube and, and some other similar video apps have have proven to be able to, to be able to do that uh, fairly well without without as many risks. My name is Emil Amogu. I am a, a third cohort student from the PCM. I just understood that the loss of uh, the loss have been providential for going further. The loss of matter caused by natural evil. Now, can the loss caused by moral evil be also providential in the in the, um, the managing? Because I wanted to ask in fact, uh, when Cardinal Pell was still speaking, that someone who has already been a failure in managing is not welcome in the administration. Is it uh, for all that someone who has already failed somewhere cannot no more manage the assets well. Is convention not possible in economical matters? Thank you. With at least some of that question, I would be happy to defray to his eminence on the, on the, on the moral matter. Uh, but from our experience with the, the earthquake, we not only see, saw the limits of the buildings and the matter which which is all transient and will all pass away someday but we also saw our own limitations and when a, a man goes through an experience of a of a traumatic moment a, a natural disaster the best of him comes out but also some of the less pleasant our faith is is bound is centered around forgiveness and, and making 
making a new start in that way. But it, it can't be separated from taking responsibility. And sometimes taking responsibility means stepping back and saying, maybe I'm not the best person to do this. It at least, it at least means asking for forgiveness and making a concrete decision not to return to that path. And we, we find today a little bit of a mix up on that, that, that one can happen with the other. But it, in, in the gospel, of course, the, the, greatest experience, the greatest moment we have of that is Mary Magdalene, who lived the rest of her life very close to Christ and was there at the foot of the cross. But he did say to her, you, you are forgiven, but sin no more. Uh, and that was a, a part, of the, part of the plan. Uh, so uh, one, I think we'd have to keep both in mind on that. I don't know if Eminence wants to add anything else. He's, he's pretty familiar with moral failures uh, too and, and how they affect us in the church and, and, and how we have to live with some of the consequences. I can only think of one example. Uh, a priest uh, was a thief. He was a, a capable man and had significant office. Uh, Bishop was very good to him, had um, got him spiritual help, psychological help, uh, reappointed him, uh, and he fell again. Good. <laughs> I think just to draw on something I said earlier, I think the approach has to be very realistic. And um, um, we, we have an idea of perfection that can sometimes put too much pressure on people too. And if, 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 it's, if it's not their particular role, it's good that they don't have it. Thank you very much. My name is Godwin Adike of the fifth, um, fifth cohort of the PCM. Um, I would humbly request, if it's possible, please to have a copy of this afterwards, please. I, I have a question on the second point. When you mentioned about the, the practical and the traditional, you know, that um, things are practical doesn't mean that they are no more traditional and vice versa. I have a problem if maybe the practical eventually um, um, tries to, to, to sway from the tradition. At what point do one, and uh, what can one do actually to redeem this tradition while being practical? Because I understand that being practical means being realistic, mm -hmm. watching the present situation as they are. And traditionalism or being traditionalistic would mean sticking to that which has been, which had been before now. So at what point and what can one do to really um, be practical as well as not um, deviating from the traditional? No, it's a good question that we, we, had to, we have to confront very often um, something as simple as a cell phone. Should a, should a monk get to have a cell phone? Is it helpful to him? Is it unhelpful to him? Uh, many, many aspects of how technology interact with our life bring up the question of the practical and the, and the traditional. I would answer with something from our Lord, and that is, you shall know them by their fruits. Uh, that is, when, when, when the disciples ask, us, how do we know? He says, well, you will, you will know by their fruits. Now, that is a more complicated answer than it seems. And we, especially in our day, have a, have a temptation to judge fruits in terms of hours and, and not in terms of decades. And uh, we, at the same time, can overestimate even our own judgment of the fruits. So slowing that process down as much as possible can be helpful. That, that can look like obstructionism, but it doesn't have to be if it's motivated, motivated by faith. If, uh, if the practical negative consequence is quite obvious right away, people are dying because of a decision I've made uh, to uh, adhere closer to one tradition or, or another, they are, they are, uh, they are starving, uh, then, uh, th then we might say that the fruits could be judged somewhat quickly, or might need to be. But often enough, it isn't the case. And we would, we would need, to give it, need to give it time to know whether in a, in, a, in a much broader historical perspective, we might, we might see that sticking to the traditional approach actually had, had, would have had more fruits, or we actually have to return to it. Uh, we had sometimes the unfortunate experience of building a wall in sheetrock, building a wall, 
only to realize that that wall actually caused us a problem with some other part of the construction we were doing. So then we started building walls in sheetrock, which are much easier to take down. Uh, and our electricians and plumbers have come to say, now you need this today, but should we plan for a little deviation of it from in some years from now? And we say, yes, plan for as many variations as possible. Uh, so uh, knowing the, uh, the, the frailty of our own judgment, trying to trust, trust in the fruits, and in being suspect too of, of our own sense that everything, everything we know and believe and, 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 and have come to understood is, is right. Uh, I'm always personally a bit worried when I say that I'm convinced about something because it, it's, a, it's a strong expression to make. And of course, we want to be convinced about our faith and the creed and our belief in God. But it's, uh, it can often be a protective mechanism to keep us from actually considering that there might be alternatives. And so when I hear myself say things like that, I try to pay attention that I might fall into a trap. Again, the particulars in your diocese, in your situation are, are always hard. I think that the, the danger now is that we don't give enough benefit of the doubt to the tradition. And we assume that the tradition means being impractical. It, it often doesn't. Uh, and in a... Uh, it, it could it could call for a better understanding of the tradition. Now, how did this come to be? Why did it come to be? How can we incorporate this uh, uh, this better? Uh, but it, uh, it 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 doesn't always mean that it needs to be thrown out. Do you have a question from James uh, online who might win the award for? Uh, earliest riser to watch the talk. He's joining us from Kansas City. Uh, so I think it's about five o'clock his time. Um, and he asked if you could maybe unpack the details around why the authorities initially rejected your plan for Monte Cassino part two. Um, and also some thoughts and reflections on how actions and thoughts began moving from the immediate needs to looking to something longer term um, you know, lo longer and greater of, of that kind of master plan that you spent time doing? Sure. The first question, why why did they reject? We, we had this beautiful plan and I said it had a Las Vegas quality. That doesn't mean it looked like a casino. Just in, a, in an Italian mindset, to build something that looks classical today, to them uh, remind, reminds many of them of a casino that is there's there are these casinos that are built to look like Venice or to build or or, or, or Rome, uh, and so that their their reluctance to 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 accept this project had to do with the sense that it was disproportionate to what was uh, what was the tra the local tradition. Mm -hmm. They appealed to zoning requirements, to legal requirements, to uh, to permissions that would be needed that would take a long time. It's often people will say, people will say to you, perhaps it is true everywhere. They won't say no, but they say, well, it's going to be very difficult. And usually, in in at least in Italy, that means five to ten years. Uh, it isn't five to ten months. In America, you hear it's going to be very difficult, and that's usually when we say, well, that's why we want it, and let's get started. That that um, it, different countries handle that in different different ways. So they they saw the building though as uh, in their own way disproportionate to the land that it would have been on, and uh, and in a way they were able to see something that we couldn't see. Uh, that, that a good sense actually uh, looking back on it now. It, it was also disproportionate to the funds that we had we we had available at the time, and our benefactors knew that too. Uh, the second question about the transition from the immediate to the long term, it uh, happens more organically than than we know. Uh, we don't. We, it isn't that after at a certain point we say, well, now now it's long term, and before before it was short term. At a certain point, one realizes that one isn't as preoccupied about what one's going to eat tonight, and can start thinking about what we're going to eat for the next three weeks. Uh, we we, uh, in the beginning days after the earthquake, had a little phrase, three days, three weeks, three months. In the next three days, we would worry about this set of problems. In the next three weeks, we would set about, worry about this set of problems. And in three months, we, hoped, we would have hoped to have resolved this set of problems. And that was about as far as we could get. 
we used to, in the beginning, think we need to plant a, a monastery for the next 1,000 years. Uh, we changed that and started talking more about planting a monastery for the next 100 years, the next 50 years. We re refocused our idea of what uh, of what we could really achieve, and and I think in the process. Uh, we're, we're able to find something more proportional. But to answer, is it James from Kansas? J to answer James's question, uh, it, it, is, it is a gradual process of moving from the immediate to the long term. As for many of you, the process of your child growing up, uh, when the baby is young, he's, he's mon months old, you, you, you're not really thinking about college, although some people do that. Uh, you're thinking about the, the next phase, the, the diapers or the eating solid food and then the walking and the talking and sooner or later before you even know it you're talking about where they should go to ki kindergarten or your, your grammar school and it happens organically the same thing i'd say happens after a tragedy like this it's very slow i'm rory conway from san diego california um I, I know your talk was billed as being uh, related to the topic of theology of place and i've been reflecting on that uh Throughout salvation history and biblical revelation, uh, we see, um, you know, various points of view on the importance of place. You know, we have in the Old Testament, God leading the people of Israel to the promised land and promising uh, that to them and the temple, of course. Um, and I've also been reflecting on our Lord's words uh, in response to a disciple about following him when he said that, you uh, Foxes have dens, but and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to rest, rest his head. And so this question, I guess, goes to the to the foundations of monastic life. But uh, I'm I'm curious to hear your perspective on um, the the how what what is the right attitude that we should have towards uh, property place to the sort of sense of building up our presence within a particular place. Uh, to give glory to God, and then on the other hand, being detached from property and place, and uh, on our journey uh, to our the heavenly Jerusalem. So thank you. I can. Res I'll try to give two responses. First, how monks handle this, and how how you and your families might handle this. The monastic concept of poverty is very different from what is commonly known in, as the Franciscan vision of pro poverty. Uh, monasteries can. And do and historically have needed to hold property. St. Benedict saw it as the key to its own independence. The more financial resources it had, the more that it owned in its own name, the less it'd be susceptible to outside influences. Therefore, the more it would be able to help its own monks to fulfill their goal, which is going to heaven. This alludes to an irony that was spoken about earlier that you need money in order to help people. Uh, and, uh, and so he, he understood the following of Christ and the foxes have their holes, but Christ has no place to lay his head. He understood that, but that would handle, that would be handled in the monastery on the individual level. So a monk turned over everything that he has ha, had and received everything from the abbot, who is the figure of the God, the father, uh, the, the eternal father who gives us everything that we need. So his poverty was understood and still is understood as not owning anything personally, but everything belongs to, to, the, to the monastery. And it was the monastery whose duty it was to see that the, the structure supported all of those uh, who, who lived there. Uh, the monk's detachment came in giving everything away. Uh, his poverty came in, in not being able to say that anything was, was his own, but his, his life was nourished in knowing that his basic needs would be provided for so that he could spend his time trying to trying to seek God. Uh, how that can apply to, uh, to, to the family today, in some ways it, it, it's, um, it's, uh, it's as simple as a realistic understanding of the present current events. That as you know, if we only look at the last three years, things that you come to rely on are not as reliable as you might think. And, are there really any safe places to keep your money, for instance, anymore? That is, we, we know people who, who buy gold bars and they keep them in their house because they think that that's the safest place. But even the, even the value of gold can go down. That is, that there, there, there are fewer and fewer very, very safe places to, uh, 
to, to hide these days. And so just to raise a family trusting in divine providence, you are always trusting that you're going to be able to provide for them. It is, it is a heroic act, I would say, to marry and to have children in a moment where there is so much uncertainty as it is. Now, we might tell ourselves, but we're really safe because we have this account or this house or this business or this piece of real estate. But in, in, in fact, in the history shows us that there really aren't many safe places. The, the, we, as, as a monastery, ha, were very intent on owning everything that we, we build on, as his eminence re reminded us today, that we had a bad experience of not owning everything. We said, this time we're going to own everything. But it, the history of Europe is, is just uh, saturated with occasions where religious who owned everything they had, had everything taken from them. Uh, and you only need to look at Bolshevik revolution in, in Russia and, and know that ownership is safe to a certain point. So I would say God gives the, the detachment in just being a, having a realistic understanding that what we have might not be as safe as what we think. And, and that can, as, as a family, already fulfill that Christ-like need to, to not call anything our own, to, to, to not know whether we'll have a place to lay our head tonight, because we really might not. You live in San Diego, you know, I'm sure that earthquake analogy is, is present to you. That is, it's um, one of the most earthquake-prone earthquake places, and if what they say is true, it's a bit overdue. Uh, yes. There isn't really, uh, uh, there isn't really uh, a safe place when we've talked, dreamt about, oh, we should find, where, where can we look on the map and find there's no danger of political, of, of political upheaval or natural disaster. But the closest we've come is to, to, to buy a boat and, uh, and some kind of houseboat where you live on a lake or a very calm sea. But even, even that isn't so safe. So I'd say just being conscious of the, the, the vulnerability that we're not God, only God is God. And as much as you might want to provide for your, your family, to always remind even your children that you, you can only do so much. Otherwise, they'll have an expectation of the father that he can't, he can't really meet. Thank you, uh, Don Benedict. And my name is Carlo Dallavedo. I'm a lawyer in Rome. And uh, I think uh, the example on that, uh, of Norcia and uh, unfortunately the, the 2016 uh, collapse of your basilic is a very good example for the purpose of this seminar. So thank you very much for bringing your testimony. And I think it's, it's important because it's, it's giving us all thoughts about how to handle things in crisis. What happened in Norcia is a typical situation of a false majeure, something that is on, out of our control. So I'm sure you will be on the front line. You've been through a very unique experience of how to handle. And, and of course, we all wish you all the best for, for the reconstruction of the Basilica. I really have two comments that I would like to ask you. One is the fact that you own a Basilica, which I believe is an historical building with a long history and perhaps registered with the Ministry of Fine Arts. Is this was uh, somehow considered? Did you have any uh, support on one side? And uh, how are you also you're going to respect the history of the building? Are you going to rebuild the, the church as it was, or are you going to do a church according to 2022 standards? And the second question is fundraising. You mentioned that you were able, and I'm curious to know, where did you find the support from the local people from Norcia, from the Umbria, from the region, from the fine arts of Italy, or international? Because today also the church in front of a crisis I think has to consider the internationalization of a fundraising campaign. So this was just really a curiosity. Thank you. Good. Uh, yeah, I should make a little clarification about spaces. Uh, so the Basilica is, is built over St. Benedict's birthplace, his home, and it was destroyed, but it, it didn't and doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the diocese. So one of the things that we had to accept after the earthquake is that we wouldn't be in control of it, of the rebuilding of the Basilica. And we chose to rebuild on a little, to rebuild on a little piece of land outside the city walls where we knew, or we think we knew, we know that we'll have a better chance of protecting it, constructing it as we see, as we see fit, where we've been able, we believe to combine modern anti-earthquake technology with classical design so that the church looks like a church that was built in 1592, which it was, and not like a church that was built in 2020, uh, 
2021, but that is as safe as a church could be in 2021. Um, the, the Basilica, as I said at one point in the talk, is in, is in the hands of God, and, and uh, one lo who looks at church history and sees that important buildings come in and out of the hands of religious communities, and we'll, we'll stay open to the to divine providence of what he wants to do there. How it will be rebuilt is not up to us. It's a massive global European project. Uh, the EU decided to put a lot of funding in there. And, uh, and there, are many, there are many interests in, in what that would look like. I can tell you that th there has been a decision that the outside should look exactly as it did. So they're rebuilding the outside so that it looked exactly as it did. And that was at the insistence of the townspeople. We talk about the kind of the, the traditional, the deep traditional DNA of a people. They wanted the outside of the church. They want the whole thing to look just as it was, but they were able to achieve the outside of the church. What will happen on the inside will take time to see. Second question about fundraising. We have many uh, generous benefactors. We didn't know we had them. On the day of the earthquake, we had nothing, absolutely nothing. Everything that we've been able to do since then, and, and it's been it's been a quite a, um, impressive rebuilding project. Uh, many, uh, many, we can say even many millions of dollars have, have come towards this this effort. Uh, a little secret that I can tell tell you is that most of the people who have given us the the largest amount of help were already people uh, that had given us a little bit of help. So if you're trying to find support for your projects, we often think we need to go find new people. And that can be the case. We've, we've had to find new people. New people have often found us. Uh, and the people who have been most supportive have been those who sent us a little bit of money. Uh, and they actually have the resources to send a little bit more. So one, one needn't always go far afield to find the help. Uh, Tom Benedict, thank you. This has been uh, a wonderful uh, presentation. When do you think we'll have Benedictine Monastery in space? In space. <laughs> it, 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 there'd be some challenges there. Yeah. Uh, our, I'm not sure how we'd make our beer up there. Uh, but uh, um, we'll see where the, where, the, where the next 50 or 100 years take us. But, uh, monks do sort of like to feel on the ground and after you've been through an earthquake one of the things that you you're most thankful for is when the ground doesn't shake having no ground underneath might be a maybe if it's for our successors i'm not sure we could do it <laughs>